Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Roy Smith considers how delayed planting might affect corn and soybean markets. Stephen Wugulo updates us on the progress of winter wheat diseases. Jim Orff compares the genetic composition of U.S. soybeans versus South American soybeans. And Jeff Bradshaw examines the potential for grasshoppers and army cutworms in the panhandle. Favorable weather through midweek gave farmers their biggest window to get a jump on 2013 spring planting. As of April 28th, Nebraska had sown only 3% of its corn crop, well behind the five-year average of 26%. What's more concerning for those hoping for big production this fall? The two states, which account for one-third of U.S. corn production, are farther behind than anyone else. Iowa has planted 2% of its corn, and Illinois has only completed 1%. Both states have a five-year average of 36% for this point in the season. Overall, U.S. corn planting progress through April 28th, the date of the latest report, is the slowest since 1984. Roy Smith is our marketing analyst this week. Light rain forced us inside when we talked Wednesday afternoon. We began by looking at the delays in planting and the progress for producers in Roy's area of southeast Nebraska. Like every place else, it's a little bit slow. Um, I suppose maybe we have 5% in the ground or 10%. I, myself, I don't plant all that much and I happen to be done. And that's a pretty good feeling, even <laughs> though it's, we're gonna, probably going to be scooping snow off of it before long. Uh, there's delayed planting not only here, but also to the east where there's a lot of corn planted in Iowa and Illinois and they haven't hardly got a start yet. Do you think that's going to start? I, I mean, maybe it already has at the beginning of this week, but is it going to start affecting the market more? It's a market factor for sure. It, I guess it, I have to look back at experience in other years that when we've had delayed planting and, you know, two years that come to mind in 1982 and 1984, and those were just about direct opposites. In 1982, there was absolutely no response to the delayed planting. Uh, the market pretty much went down from the middle of April all the way through October. Uh, in 1984, there was some excitement, uh, some sharp uh, up days, and, and then uh, about the middle of June, the market figured out that the corn actually did get planted and the beans got planted too, even though some uh, not such good conditions, but then the bottom sort of fell out of the market at that point. Do you think there's any talk that's going to be about shifting acres that would affect the market? There'll always be talk about shifting acres. You know, that's, it, it sort of seems logical that if it, it's, it's late, mm -hmm. it'd be better to switch from corn to beans. And that's fine if you're in Chicago or St. Louis or somewhere like mm -hmm. that that doesn't understand how crops grow. But uh, a lot of people use a little bit of atrazine in their pre-emergence chemicals. And of course, if you've done that, you can't plant soybeans. Uh, most people have their seed bought. Uh, most people are set up to handle a certain ratio of corn to beans, and so I, it's an important psychological factor from all practical purposes. It probably doesn't have any long-term effect. Does this in any way chase some of the bears away? We know the, uh, the corn yield will be reduced at least a little bit because of the delayed planting. Uh, there was such a big number talked about for corn acres. Does it maybe chase the bears away for a little bit? I think you have a, a good way of putting that. I think that uh, you know, there, there probably will be some people that will, will look at that and say, well, I'm going to I'm going to go long yeah. corn or I'm going to get out of this short, short position yeah. in corn. And in reality, the, the supplies are very tight now for old crop corn and old crop beans, both. 
And, and that's probably a, a factor that will cause the potential shift to be bigger than it would otherwise. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not giving up on this uh, idea of having some uh, rally in the corn market based on that. But, uh, well, we saw a limit up day earlier this, yeah. earlier this week. And so I hope that's not all there is to it. I hope there's another week of this that gives us a chance to get some new crop uh, grain sold. Before we get to new crop, what are the recommendations for old crop here? If you're trying to maybe finish up a little bit here, if you're trying to find a run, where do you think it might come from? Any time now, I'd say just if you've got old crop grain, unless you're willing to hold no matter what in case of a drought or something, you look at the seasonal price trend charts and before we tape this show, I went through several different versions of my seasonal price trend chart and this April, May and early June time period, year in and year out, whether it's a dry year or a wet year, just been a good time to sell cash grain, especially corn, but corn and beans both. And so, you know, if you've got those bushels in the bin and unless you're just uh, really wanting to gamble with them, <laughs> let's, let's get them moved and, and uh, then take the opportunity to look for new crop opportunities. Where do those come from? I know you're a little different because this area of the state doesn't have much irrigation, so it's a little harder to say what you feel comfortable putting on the line, but what are the recommendations? Everybody's got their own level, and you know, I, I look at that and I say, well, under normal conditions, I'm pretty comfortable forward contracting 40% or 50% of corn or beans, either one. Now, it's at under normal conditions, but we've got an inverse in the market now where we've got nearby futures so much higher than deferred futures that I guess I'm, I'm wanting to be a little more conservative than normal unless we get a big bump in the new crop bids. Right now we're looking at such a discount for new crop in both the futures and the basis that uh, m my recommendation of people that really want me to, to stick my neck out, I say, look at your break even. If your potential break even is above your cost of production at, uh, with a normal crop, then do 20%. Uh, even if you're selling into a discount like we are, you know, a discount can get worse as well as better. So, you know, you, you pr probably want to sell something during this May, June time period, but uh, don't go overboard with it. There are a lot of things that can happen between now and harvest. Next week, we'll take a look at the cattle markets with Mike Briggs. Nebraska's winter wheat crop is developing in what can easily be labeled less than ideal conditions. To help illustrate the point, in west central Nebraska, Lincoln Journal Star reported this week North Platte went 365 days without recording more than an inch of rain in any single day. Total precipitation since the end of last April equaled just more than 7.2 inches, which broke a previous record set during the 1930s. 44% of Nebraska's winter wheat is now rated as either poor or very poor, but the reasons could be varying. Wheat in the Panhandle and in the southwestern corner of the state is not only suffering from drought, but it also saw April temperatures fall below freezing. Meanwhile, wheat in southeast Nebraska has recently seen cool, wet weather move in, opening the threat for disease. We talked with UNL Extension plant pathologist Stephen Wagulo Tuesday about how soil-borne mosaic and other diseases could affect this year's crop. We have had very cold temperatures, uh, as, as you have seen, uh, prolonged in April and as uh, a result of that uh, the wheat crop is about two to three weeks behind schedule. One of the, so, sorry, one of the things that we're seeing across the state uh, or at least the southeastern portion is wheat soil borne mosaic virus. How widespread is it and uh, how detrimental can it be? Well this virus is pretty much widespread in southeast uh, Nebraska and uh, even south central Nebraska. Um, you can see uh, large patches of yellow standard wheat in uh, wheat fields and the virus is transmitted by a, a soil borne fungus which is favored by cool wet weather and as you know we have had uh, some rainy weather and that has favored wheat soil borne mosaic so it's quite widespread uh, in southeast and south central Nebraska. Are there any treatment options or treatment things that people can do now? No, this is a virus and usually once wheat is infected by a virus, there is nothing that can be done. However, for next year, 
uh, you can choose resistant varieties. That's the most effective way uh, to manage wheat soilborne mosaic virus and any other viruses of wheat. Since we're so far behind normal, what do you expect to see or what would we normally expect to see around this time of the year that therefore might be coming up around the corner? Well, uh, by now we should have been seeing stripe rust, but because the, uh, we had so uh, a prolonged cool period, uh, we, we don't have that rust in Nebraska yet, but there have been reports of stripe rust in Oklahoma. So we expect in three to four weeks, we may see some stripe rust in Nebraska. And so at this time, um, growers should be out uh, scouting their fields. They should start scouting not only to, for early detection of stripe rust and other diseases like uh, tan spot and uh, powder mildew, uh, but they should also be uh, getting prepared in case we get stripe rust, then they should be uh, prepared to apply a fungicide, especially if they have a variety that is susceptible and also if uh, this wet weather is going to continue because that disease is favored by cool and wet uh, uh, weather. So even in the uh, irrigated and non-irrigated in some portions where we've had a lot of rain? If we have a lot of rain, it doesn't really matter whether it's, wheat is irrigated or not. The environmental conditions will be favorable for disease development. Uh, anything with uh, leaf rust that we've seen anywhere outside of Nebraska? Uh, we have seen leaf rust uh, to a small extent in Oklahoma, but in the southern states like uh, Texas and uh, Arkansas and Louisiana, uh, we have uh, quite um, a wide, widespread leaf rust. So leaf rust comes a little later than uh, stripe rust. So we expect to see stripe rust first and then maybe towards the end of May uh, we may start seeing uh, leaf rust in Nebraska. And any uh, susceptibility or potential damage from powdery mildew that you see on the front? Powdery mildew is another disease. Uh, it, it can cause uh, substantial damage to wheat, especially in um, irrigated wheat or wheat that has uh, there's, where there's a lot of moisture and the, the, the stand is thick, uh, it can cause up to, again, maybe 20-25% yield loss in uh, susceptible varieties. And again, uh, this is part of the reason uh, folks should be out there scouting to, and if they detect uh, powder mildew or any other leaf diseases, then they should be prepared to apply uh, a fungicide. Taking a look at wheat to the south, the Wheat Quality Council's hard winter wheat tour took place this week. Day one showed an average yield at 43.8 bushels per acre, according to DTN. Day two saw an average of 37.1 bushels per acre. UNL researchers have confirmed glyphosate resistance in common water hemp from six Nebraska counties, Antelope, Dodge, Lancaster, Pawnee, Seward, and Washington. Because of phone calls from growers during the 2012 growing season, researchers collected common water hemp seeds from fields in those six counties and performed dose response studies in a UNL greenhouse. The response showed resistance at a minimum of six times the normal rate and a maximum of 25 times the normal rate. UNL experts recommend future treatment of glyphosate resistant water hemp to include different modes of action, crop rotation, and a combination of tillage systems. In our continuing coverage from the 2013 World Soybean Research Conference in Durban, South Africa, today we'll show you our interview with Jim Orp from the University of Minnesota. If you work with soybeans, you know the bean is basically broken down into soybean meal and soybean oil. Buyers might want different amounts of protein or varying amounts of fat, which they might be able to get when purchasing from the U.S. or South America. We talked with Jim about the variability in beans and why their genetic composition is so important. Well, in the past, we've measured just the protein and oil content of soybean, but we realized the value to the end users is more in the amino acids on the protein side and the fatty acids on the oil side. So we're trying to look at those uh, components to see what might be in the soybeans, not only in the North American uh, production, but also in South American production. What is important to the customer? Because you hear a lot of uh, Asian buyers talking about the difference between U.S. beans and South American beans when it comes to oil or protein. What do they want? Well, in, in the protein side, what they're really looking at is the essential amino acids that are needed for production for mainly poultry and swine. On the oil side, they're looking at uh, either the saturated or the unsaturated fatty acids 
in terms of how it functions in making different kinds of food and in frying food. Contrast for me the U.S. bean versus the South African or the South American bean, excuse me, and we can go into you know what all plays into that. But on the face of it, contrast those two. Well, in in uh, the U.S., most of our soybean production tends to be sort of what I would call the um, temperate or the middle latitudes where a significant portion of the South American production tends to be more in the subtropical or even tropical areas. Um, as a result of that, um, they have higher temperatures when the soybean is maturing, so they tend to have slightly higher levels of protein and or oil. But when we start looking at the components of the protein and oil, uh, the North American soybeans tend to be better from a nutritional standpoint for the meal and for the kinds of characteristics that people want in the oil. The third component which um, we're starting to realize is important in animal production is the uh, content of the soluble sugars, which is mainly sucrose. And again, when you go further away from the equator, you tend to have higher levels of sucrose, and that adds more energy to the soybean meal. So for people feeding livestock, say Asian buyers, they're not just looking at protein necessarily. Protein isn't the end game. Protein is not the end game, and I think the Asian buyers have uh, known that over the years, and that's why, given a choice that the prices are comparable, they will take U.S. soybean over South American soybean. So specifically for the United States, what do you look at doing? I mean, what can be improved or where are there areas? Well, there's always areas that we can improve. Uh, we don't want to give up um, increasing yield because that's what the farmers get paid on. But we are looking specifically at uh, some of the essential amino acids, so lysine, cysteine, methionine, and then uh, threonine and tryptophan, which are the most important for poultry and swine production. Um, we're also looking at the oil side, and more of this is being done in the private sector, but we're also doing it in the public sector, at looking at high oleic soybean, which produces an oil that is uh, better from a health standpoint, as well as a functionality, particularly for frying. To see our previous interviews from the World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa, including discussions on Brazil soybean harvest, crop rotations in the Midwest, and South Africa's agricultural potential, you can log on to marketjournal.unl.edu slash South Africa. Nathan Goobles knew he wanted to return to the family farm when he was in high school. The May Nebraska Farmer cover story explains how Nathan used a Farm Service Agency direct operating loan and a Nebraska State Beginning Farmer Tax Credit program after college to make his dream come true. He farms near Randolph with his father John and also works for a neighboring farm to supplement his income. You can read about Nathan and the Beginning Farmer program in May's Nebraska Farmer. Poor growth conditions in the panhandle may lead to lower numbers of grasshoppers this year. That's one pest on the mind of producers in the West. We talked with UNL Extension entomologist Jeff Bradshaw from his office in the panhandle earlier this week about army cutworms and the potential for reduced grasshopper populations. This year in the western U.S., the results of the survey, the adult survey, um, at the end of 2012 uh, is indicating that the likelihood of high grasshopper populations is pretty low uh, throughout the western U.S. And in fact, right now, uh, if you look at the prediction map for the western U.S., uh, Nebraska is the only uh, sort of hot spot potential for any um, substantial grasshopper population. What all plays into the, the high numbers or the low numbers, either potential? Uh, well, uh, particularly this time of year, uh, rainfall uh, can play into it, uh, as well as the availability of, of food. So um, we don't have a lot of availability of food uh, for grasshoppers right now uh, due to the drought that we've had. Um, so I guess there's one uh, optimistic aspect of, of some of the harsh weather that we've had. Uh, but right now we're also getting some um, pretty good spring rains in parts of, uh, parts of Nebraska. So that's going to contribute to a reduction 
of an already reduced potential for grasshopper numbers. So if there are areas that do flare up, Jeff, what are the scouting and treatment recommendations? Uh, we have, um, in rain, for rangeland grasshoppers, uh, we say around 15 uh, or more per square yard is sufficient um, average grasshopper number for considering treatment. And then we've got the reduced area agent treatment program uh, where strips of rangeland can be left untreated and treated to uh, both conserve beneficial insects and then suppress uh, pest grasshoppers. So we have a, a program there that uh, also then saves, uh, can have the cost in um, insecticide application uh, while conserving beneficial insects. We had talked about a month ago about the potential for uh, high cutworm numbers or high cutworm damage. There was a large infestation of army cutworms in this part of the state at least last year. What does the potential look like for this year out west? Yeah, so um, so far this spring I've seen some wheat fields that have had some um, substantial losses due to army cutworm feeding. Um, they, the moths lay eggs in the fall, uh, the larvae develop on a lot of different crops uh, and non-crop areas. Uh, wheat and alfalfa are a couple that we uh, pay a lot of attention to right now. Um, and they continue to develop over the winter, continue feeding. And so this spring we found some fields of alfalfa and wheat that have been hit by army cutworms. Uh, it's very difficult to control them at this point of the year. Uh, and right now a lot of the fields that I've scouted have fairly large larvae, which is indicating that they're about ready to start pupating in the soil and stop feeding. Um, so uh, army cutworm potential, the outlook for them in some of our spring planted crops, uh, maybe our risk is a little bit lower because of the advanced development of the army cutworms. You haven't done any spraying though, Jeff? Uh, no, uh, we have, um, I haven't heard of any spraying uh, being reported for army cutworm. Um, but uh, usually what happens is a uh, producer sees a substantial amount of loss that basically occurred over the winter um, and uh, oftentimes is, is a little behind the curve uh, on treatment. So is it worth it then to go out and scout or not? Uh, you know, I think it's worth scouting just to assess the situation uh, and see if really you did have economic levels. Um, there might be uh, some situations where you find a couple cutworms here and there uh, and it can be combined with uh, some of the winter kill that we've seen in, in winter wheat, uh, which can also be combined with um, some of the issues we've had with the lack of moisture and, and reduced stands due to that. So I, I think it's a good idea to still scout uh, just to ensure that um, the cause of whatever your stand loss might be would actually be due to cutworms or some other factor. Jeff says the high potential for army cutworms means the number of miller moths will likely be high as well. He advises scouting around homes later in the season. Widespread rain and snow moved across Nebraska beginning Wednesday. Here with what's in store for the next few days is UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. What a miserable end of this last week that we had this big storm come into the northern plains, brought the cold weather into our region. Of course, temperatures were basically in the upper 20s to the upper 30s depending on location of the state. We had the extensive cloud cover and then we had the cooling of the atmosphere that was able to deliver some pretty significant snowfall accumulations across the southern panhandle, portions of northeastern Nebraska where we have had reports of greater than six inches of snowfall. Further southward, generally in the one to three inch range to trace as you go along the Kansas-Nebraska border. And of course in terms of liquid equivalent moisture, one to two inches of moisture were common across the eastern half of the state lesser totals across western Nebraska and the southwest was the area that missed out on a good portion of this precipitation where generally we were in the quarter to half inch range. Now as we go forward in time we're going to be dealing with this pesky troughing system at least in eastern Nebraska for a couple days and then we start to see so much warmer weather come into our region. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we can expect as we go through this next seven day period and here's that upper air low that's been cut off. It basically the trough drove down and then this low cut off and it's going to meander slowly toward the lower Ohio River Valley. So with this moisture wrapping around the system, there's a good chance that most of eastern Nebraska will see scattered showers, particularly through this weekend, with the best 
heaviest precipitation likely across southeastern Nebraska. The farther west you go, the drier the conditions are, and we should see some fairly decent conditions across western Nebraska. As we get into Sunday, we'll notice that system starting to move, lift toward our east. We'll get the high pressure building in and drying conditions. We're not expecting much of any significant moisture toward the afternoon hours of Sunday across the state. As we get into Monday, much better conditions. We're going to be under the influence of a high pressure system. We should have a couple days without any significant moisture. And as we get into Tuesday, we'll notice that ridge is still in place. And as we get into Wednesday, we start to see a little bit of energy from this western United States trough trying to build in, and it might shoot off a little bit of energy into the central plains, and it possibly generate an isolated thunderstorm during the maximum heating of the day, particularly late afternoon and early evening hours. But it looks to be very wide or very lightly in terms of the, where it's going to be coverage-wise. More importantly, we get another piece of energy moving across on Thursday, and this one may generate some fairly decent thunderstorm activity across portions of central and eastern Nebraska, possibly even western Nebraska. The models are a little bit iffy on this. By the time we get to Friday, we'll see that we start to get a little troughing action, and we may actually see some fairly widespread precipitation across the eastern two-thirds of the state, and that may actually carry into next Saturday. In terms of temperatures, as we look to, toward the future, we see the gradual warm-up as the wheat progresses as we move back into the 70s across eastern Nebraska by Wednesday. We may approach the 80s across western Nebraska, and of course there's those chances for thunderstorm activity toward the latter half of next week. In terms of 8 to 14 day forecast, we're looking at cooler than normal conditions. In terms of precipitation, I think that this may be under, overdone. I think we're going to see closer to normal to above normal precipitation in our forecast. Thanks, Al. Our interviews with Roy Smith, Stephen Wagulo, Jim Orff, and Jeff Bradshaw are available individually on the Market Journal website as part of the May 3rd episode. Next week, Mike Briggs will be our marketing analyst. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.